This is Daybreak Asia. We're counting down to market opens in Japan and South Korea, just a few seconds away now. And uh, Heidi, really, what a start to the week here. You've got uh, the US strikes on Iraq, uh, Houthis, that's boosting tensions in the Middle East. You've got these expectations around the Fed, how that changed following the US jobs report. And adding to it all, you've got Beijing that's pledging assistance for its local <laughs> stock markets. <laughs> Pretty busy start to the year that we've had, right? And certainly we're continuing to also watch for our bread and butter, the fact that, yes, we're watching the Fed. We're also watching the RBA, the first decision uh, of the year to take place this week as well. And, and really watching, as with every central bank this year, the signalling, the uh, communication is going to be key. Yeah, that's right. Certainly want to know what they're going to be uh, indicating around uh, Fed rate cuts. We do actually have, Heidi, uh, some lines that are just dropping now on Jay Powell, and I think you'll ha maybe have some more context on those for us. Yes, that's right. We are hearing uh, from Jay Powell at the moment, and uh, really, in terms of uh, this is of course an interview when it comes to uh, the 60 Minutes interview that he's doing on CBS, a transcript that we're getting through. Jay Powell saying it's unlikely the Fed will have the confidence to cut in March. That's really interesting. That uh, rate forecasts are not likely changed much since December. That integrity is priceless, and that's a quote. They don't consider politics. Of course, lots of concerns as to you know how potentially the the Fed might be impacted going into a key political year for the US, not to mention the, the geopolitical overlay that you spoke about right at the top, how this is impacting oil prices, energy prices, supply chains, again, right, being impacted and how that feeds through to inflation. Chair Powell saying that they're making good progress, but the job is not done, that the risk of moving too soon would be inflation settling above 2% and falling into that trap, saying that the, uh, the Fed is on path to price stability, but they're committed to fully restoring storing price uh, stability there. Uh, one big factor, of course, he mentions pandemic effects and the inflation surge. They don't see the economic turmoil of China as having a big impact in the U.S. We kind of talk about that a lot as to whether that sort of exported deflationary spiral could be uh, something that impacts major economies outside of China, Bill. Yeah, that's right. Uh, we're really seeing sort of that story of U.S. strength and, and, and China really not playing too much into their thinking of the Fed. But uh, the market reaction we're seeing is very clear here because you've got those yields that are continuing to move higher. Following what came through on the Friday session as well, it was that blockbuster U.S. Job, jobs report telling us that the U.S. economy is really powering ahead. And we saw that reflected in the, the market reaction because we had U.S. stocks really liking the tune of that. Let's take a look at how those dynamics... We saw Japan there just coming online to the upside. But let's take a look at Korea because we haven't seen the, the Kospi trading just yet. And you can see here, yes, that's Japan stocks that are moving to the upside. But let's take a look at, at the Kospi likewise see if the, that good news is flowing across in the session so far actually not the same story here a little bit of weakness creeping in uh, but we also have Heidi Aussie stocks that are one hour into the session that's right. One hour into the session, it's been a pretty tricky session so far for Australian equities. And uh, we have really seen that this is a market that has struggled to kind of extend to new record highs despite starting the, off the year uh, so close. We're now extending those losses now, downside of about one and uh, a quarter of one percent. We're seeing the steepest losses through materials. That's down by over two percent. Real estate is also off by almost two percent. And energy, despite the fact that we do see oil prices uh, higher uh, on the back of these increased geopolitical tensions, the airstrikes that we've been talking about the energy sector trading in Australia is down by just over one percent at the moment we're also watching the Aussie dollar 6504 is where we're trading at the moment we had a fifth straight week of declines for the Aussie dollar we're heading into the RBA decision the first of the year where economists are unanimously expecting uh, Governor Bullock to keep that cash rate at 4.35 percent probably maintain that hawkish stance given uh, that Australian inflation is higher than what we see in the US and the cash rate is about one percentage point below the feds but this is a revamped communication regime that we're expecting from the RBA so a lot of scrutiny on how they use that communication regime and what we hear in terms of signaling for inflation expectations uh, to come right and also taking a look at uh, what we're seeing for uh, treasuries at the moment as we continue to uh, kind of digest the messaging from chair Powell as uh, 
He tells 60 Minutes that the Fed is likely to wait beyond March to cut, really stressing the caution on the danger of moving too soon on rate cuts, the idea of integrity uh, and really being able to, you know, in a permanent and significant way, uh, reinforce price stability. The 2024 rate forecast, he says, probably haven't changed dramatically from what we saw back in December, saying that the Fed wants to see more economic data to assure that inflation is on that sustainable, sustainable path to 2% or potentially potentially risk it getting stuck above 2%, right? So really waiting beyond March to cut, we're going to see some repricing, some sort of changing of expectations when it comes to how markets potentially react to this. Yeah, well, I mean, we're seeing that reaction there, I guess, Heidi. Yields continuing to move higher as Powell continues to press back on these market expectations that we'd see a cut as soon as March. Let's get more on that now and bring in Ken Peng. He is Asia-Pacific Head of Investment Strategy at City Global Wealth. And Ken, I'm interested in your views that we just have these lines coming out from Jay Powell uh, pushing back on these market expectations. What's your take on it so far? Sure. Actually, I think this uh, current market situation is similar to last summer, where we had a, a series of strong data, and then it go kind of all got revised away. Um, for example, this payroll you, know, you noted, right? It's the, the, the household uh, number was actually down. Employment was actually down about 700,000 over the past two months. And then when you do, uh, look at total labor input, which is average hours times payrolls, it's actually down in January. It's, only, it's been flat for the past... 12 months. So, uh, you know, it's, the U.S. economy is doing fine, but I just don't think it's all guns are blazing, uh, you know, at the, as, as the, the payroll's headline would seem to suggest. Um, so for, for the Fed, I think their, their own forecast is, uh, I think, 75 basis points this year, and um, Powell seems to reaffirm that in his commentary as well. So, look, I think March has always been kind of too much of a rush in our view. Uh, we do think that middle of the year is much more reasonable and we stay by that view at the moment. Another line that, that came out from this is, is Jay Powell saying that the greatest threat to the global economy is geopolitical risks. Right. How is that likely to think or inform their thinking around Fed rate cuts, do you think? Um, I, I think, okay, first of all, the, the situation in the Red Sea, it is increasing shipping costs. But it's not completely stopping it, right? Because you can just go around Africa. And it does not, re it's not directly affecting the final product, right? And it doesn't really affect that much trade related to the US. So I don't, I don't actually think that, you know, if it stays regional like it is now, I don't really think this is going to be a major factor for the Fed. Um, but of course, if it expands significantly, that would be a very different question. So. The market dynamics, though, we have really seen them, them agitating. Given we're continuing to get this pushback on Fed rate cuts, even though we do have that strength, but you said that the, you didn't think that you, the U.S. economy is quite as strong as the U.S. jobs right. print suggests. Right. Uh, how do you expect equities then to perform, U.S. ones, I mean? Yes. Um, look, I think the last year is very much about the Magnificent Seven. So far this year, they've been leading still. Uh, I think a lot of it has to do with whenever the market is uncertain about rates, they will go to those very few companies, right? Um, so the performance becomes very narrow. Um, but, you know, I, like, like I said before, this, this initial strength coming out on payrolls probably gets revised away as time goes through. Um, so, so I, 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 you know, once the, the rate cut expectations come back in again, uh, I think we'll see broader um, performance coming out of the U.S. equities. Uh, generally speaking, you know, last, last year out of the 11 sectors, there were only four that had positive earnings growth. This year, well, I think all of them has a good chance of generating positive earnings growth because rates and inflation are both lower. Ken, I want to talk about China. CSRC vowing to stabilise markets. It's, it's unclear, you know, to what extent they're willing to go to. I don't think we're going to get the kitchen sink approach from Beijing. Anything short of that, is that going to change uh, the, the ultimate narrative when it comes to how investors feel? Right. Well, I mean, if we get this $10 trillion, uh, <laughs> that, will, that will be helpful. But, um, but even the previously uh, rumored $2 trillion hasn't really kicked in yet, right? So, so I, I don't know what the, what the exact plan is. But I think so far what we see is they're throwing a lot of money at a problem that is not caused by the lack of money, 
right? Credit growth, like total social financing, if you will. Last year, it was twice the speed of nominal GDP, right? So there's no lack of money. And, um, and so the, what, what, what lacks is confidence. And what they need to do is to uh -huh. generate more economic dynamism by reducing controls, reducing regulations, by pushing forward governance so that companies are more encouraged to increase the ROE, you know, perhaps dividend payments, buybacks, similar to what Tokyo Stock Exchange is doing. It's, it's not setting up stabilization funds. I, I don't think that's going to be very helpful in the long run. Um, but of course, given how, where, where we are in terms of valuations and sentiment, it might not take that much to have a little bit of bounce, but then uh, you know, I think the, the longevity of that rally is still very much in question. It, it, is it in question because ultimately this is if you if you accept that this is a structural slowdown that Beijing knows that it's a structural slowdown it knows it has to kind of just muddle through uh, try not to have the rest of the property sector implode how do you invest around that if if big stimulus is not going to be the answer I think we'll, we'll have to focus on the sectors that are not politically sensitive and still able to generate money I think tourism is one of those sectors that's uh, Moving forward, right? China is trying to use the tourism, uh, um, I guess, industry to, uh, to 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 restore some consumer uh, spending. Um, aside from that, I think the the sectors that are getting specific government help uh, should be should be doing relatively better. Um, but you know, if you're looking at the semiconductor uh, supply chain, I think there's probably better. Um, destinations for investment in the U.S. or Europe or even Japan uh, compared to uh, you know Chinese names. Yeah. Yeah, I'm actually on that point of, of semiconductors because you're seeing that that bifurcation, I guess, between the U.S. and and Western countries. Do you prefer then, if you're going to go into that sort of sector, to look for names that are in Korea and Taiwan instead? Yes, I, I, I would actually because they are they they have a, they have been trading at a discount versus the U.S. and I think in Taiwan's case the, the, there was a lot of geopolitical baggage, but I think at least the cross strait relationship is stable for now. So so I think I think the um, the the discount that these Asian uh, semiconductor names um, should narrow as we as we go forward um, because they're very critical to the global supply chain and this whole. Uh, you know, increased sens sensitivity about security, right? Yeah. Ken, great to have you with us. Ken Pong, uh, Asia Pacific Head of Investment Strategy at City Global Wealth. Let's take a look at some of the early movers uh, at the moment, particularly uh, as we are tracking one stock in particular. This is. Uh, as we're watching Panasonic as one of the stocks, and it, it is a big uh, week for earnings, of course, particularly when it comes to uh, tech being in focus. We're seeing that sort of ADR being tracked, rising after the third quarter operating profit beat estimates, and that is being uh, extended into the regular session. We're seeing Panasonic up by just about 4% there. Uh, the Consumer Electronics uh, Group reporting operating income for the third quarter. That was a beat on expectations. A lot of analysts said that was actually a positive su surprise, and perhaps that the markets were a little too pessimistic, and uh, that bearishness that it's held will potentially begin to fade. There's quite a bit of interest in Panasonic's acceleration of uh, the restructuring efforts as well as a strong battery efforts across the North America market as well. Bloomberg Intelligence expecting that it could achieve its full year sales and uh, OP profit for the 2024 fiscal year. We are also watching uh, ASI. They are launching their Alzheimer's drug, Eloquembi, in China, according to reporting from Reuters. They're seeing growth accelerate significantly in 2025. Uh, and of course, any kind of pharmaceutical approval or release in China, a big, big deal. We are, though, seeing that stock down by six tenths of a percent, Bill. Yeah, one to keep tracking and a lot of, as you said, a big focus on earnings in the session. Today we're seeing the likes of Mizuho, for instance, uh, also rising. But uh, let's move ahead to what we're checking uh, in the next few minutes. Uh, China pledging to stabilise markets after shares sunk to a five-year low. We're going to be discussing Beijing's effort to shore up investor confidence with Credit Agricole. But first, we'll get the latest on the crisis in the Middle East as the US threatens more strikes against Iran's forces and its proxies. That and more ahead. This is Bloomberg.
Well, the Biden administration says it will carry out more attacks on Iran's forces and its proxies in the Middle East after three days of airstrikes in Yemen, Syria and Iraq. Let's get the latest from Bloomberg's Michael Heath. And Michael, I suppose that multiple questions, you know, do, does this deter or does this um, really just elevate tensions across the region? does it further U.S. strategic interests? It's hard to see how it does, Heidi, and, and I think it, it's almost like a, um, they, they have to do it. They have to respond. Does it do anything? It's hard to say because they, they also flagged this so far ahead of time that it was almost like they were saying to the Iranians, get your people out of here so we don't escalate it. Um, while they're still targeting um, weapons depots and, and these sorts of areas, it, um, I mean, it, it sends a signal that the US will respond. Does it deter? It's very, very hard to see how it does that. What it does do, though, is it further destabilizes Iraq, um, which is, you know, obviously it's had Iranian strikes on it there, and now it's got US strikes there. Uh, Syria has also been at the center of that, but Syria's obviously had a civil war. But Iraq is sort of, um, you know, the US has obviously spent a lot of time trying to rebuild Iraq, and, and now it finds itself bombing it. So it's, it's really, it's an awkward situation where they, they've got to be seen to be doing something, and they don't want to overdo it. Um, what, what's the outcome of that? I think not a, not, a, not a lot other than for those obviously under the bombing. Um, so this is probably likely to continue. How much impact it has on, um, on Iran's proxies, it, it's hard to see that it really deters them. Certainly the Houthis, um, there, were, there were strikes on them recently as well. Uh, and they said, well, that means war, we'll, we'll keep going. So it's very, very difficult to, to see this as, uh, as changing the ball game. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is also going back for a, a fifth tour of the region since the war broke out uh, back in October. Is that likely to sh move the dial at all? Yeah, I mean, Annabelle, he's, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, they're, they're obviously very, very keen, uh, the US, um, on, on getting some sort of deal, and Qatar as well in the region, on some sort of ceasefire deal here with uh, with Israel and Hamas. Now, there was quite a bit of movement, or seemed like movement, last week. Um, the weekend prior, there was a meeting in Paris of security uh, chiefs from, from various countries with stake in, uh, stake in it. Um, Hamas hasn't responded yet. Uh, an offer has been made. Prime Minister Netanyahu has said that, you know, Israel Israel hasn't agreed to everything that's in the media, so it's it's um, you know we're sort of in a grey zone there. And, and national U.S. national security advisor Jake Sullivan said the ball's really in Hamas's court, and he didn't sound terribly confident that a deal was was going to come to pass. But I think that's the big next step we're, we're coming to. I mean, if if there's a possibility of getting getting a prolonged ceasefire, of releasing these hostages, um, and and obviously uh, the Palestinians being able to get more aid, the, the people in Gaza being able to get more. aid, uh, that may well be a stepping stone to actually bringing an end to this conflict. But the, the hopes aren't great at the moment. Certainly the reports aren't, aren't showing a lot of confidence on, on any of the sides yet. But we really do have to wait to hear what some, Hamas says on that. Yeah, certainly escalating. Uh, that was Bloomberg's Michael Heath there. And we can take a look at how oil is reacting to the events as well over the weekend. And uh, crude is a little bit higher in, in early trade here. You're seeing Brent crude and WTI. But a steep weekly loss the, the five sessions prior. There's so a bit of context also around that. Uh, let's bring in Bloomberg's Sue Keenan in New York. And uh, Sue... Yeah, oil really sort of caught between this, these, these supply, but also the concerns around demand as well. Yeah, there are a number of bearish factors that caused oil to be down more than 7 percent, both West Texas Intermediate and Brent last week, which we'll get to. Uh, but you can see there's a lot of green on the screen. Nonetheless, as this much-awaited response by the U.S. and its ally, the uh, U.K., uh, has now occurred over the weekend, this has been the first chance to react. U.S. and allies targeted Houthi sites in 13 locations in Yemen. Again, it's the biggest barrage uh, by these two allies since the initial attacks on January 11th. But as you can see by this Bloomberg chart, uh, these attacks by the Houthis began in the Red Sea in November. And even though the Biden administration has vowed to end them uh, together with allies, there's been mixed results so far, as we just heard. These attacks have been continuing, even as we see U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken again heading uh, to the Middle East uh, for a fifth trip since the Israel-Hamas war started. Now, let's get to some of those bearish factors, as Annabelle mentioned. 
Uh, there's certainly a supply issue. Uh, but what really pushed oil prices down was a combination of factors uh, to cause the biggest weekly tumbles since early October. There are reports of a potential ceasefire, early talks to sort of pause the israel Hamas conflict, uh, fresh indications the world's markets are adequately supplied. Uh, and you've got a number of different technical factors. Uh, West Texas Intermediate's prompt spread turning into contango, uh, which is very bearish. Uh, and there was a breach in two key oil market technicals that triggered algorithmic selling. We also see the dangers in the Red Sea have caused a major shift in the way oil is being bought and shipped. Yeah, initially when we started seeing these disruptions in November with the first of the Houthi attacks, a lot of analysts weighed in that it was, was temporary uh, and we saw a lot of ships taking alternative routes, uh, going around the tip of Africa, for instance, a lot more costly and delays. But since these attacks have begun continuing and disrupting global trade, we're now seeing major shifts, uh, namely, according to one ship tracking firm, we're seeing a lot of the world's global oil uh, buyers opt for local cargoes over their traditional uh, oil buys, and they're looking for an easier route. So again, there's been a big downturn in the amount of traffic and a change in the way uh, oil buyers uh, purchase oil as a result. Bloomberg Sue Keenan there with the latest on oil. Much more to come here on Daybreak Asia. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg opinion columnist Mohamed Alarian says that the blockbuster U.S. jobs report presents a problem for the Fed. He told us that a March rate cut is now off the table. What an amazing jobs report. It just confirms that this is an exceptional labor market that's going to feed into the exceptionalism of the U.S. economy. I do think it's a bit of a headache for the Fed um, because of the wage growth numbers. Lots of people have been warning about wage growth, about service inflation, and that just re-emphasizes um, that warning. And then finally for the markets, look, this means March is off the table. March should have been off the table for a while, as you and I have discussed, but this means March is off the table. It also means that you are more likely to get the three cuts that the Fed has signaled, three to four, rather than the higher number that the markets has been romancing. Do you think that May is potentially off the table too, Mohammed, given the fact that we're seeing wage pressures that are going in the wrong direction for the Fed? You know, I was with you last week and I said June is what I think should happen and what I think is likely to happen. And that this report just feeds into that. Mohammed, so what do, what do you think it means in terms of the U.S. election? Can they cut closer to the election now, given March is off the table? What's the window they actually have? So, Anna Maria, I'm going to ask you whether you think the Fed is influenced by politics. I tend to believe the view that the Fed is apolitical and that they will do what they think is right. Uh, for the administration, this is a two-sided sword, because on the one hand, it, it is good for them that the economy is doing so well. On the other hand, there is concern that as you get closer to the election, you start, you're going to start getting the weakening that results from buffers, balance sheets having been used to power this economy. So, you know, it's good news for them right now, but I think that they have to keep an eye to what's going to happen closer to November. I'm looking through these numbers, and the revisions are just sort of stunning as well. I mean, everything is just being revised up to the upside, also just coming in hotter than expected. Mohammed, what do you make of that, the fact that people are getting it wrong, and they're not getting it wrong for the weakness. They're getting it wrong for the incredible strength under the hood that's behind some of the strength that we've seen so far. And that has been the consistent story, Lisa, for the last 18 months. You know, I keep on reminding people that going into 2023, the consensus is consensus was um, recession. We ended up with a nearly 5% growth rate in the third quarter, 3.3% in the fourth quarter. Estimates suggest that strength remains. And pending corrections from Mike McKee, who's looking at the details, <laughs> this at first sight, and I just had a very quick, quick glance, looks like a very broad-based strength. That was uh, Bloomberg Opinion columnist Mohamed El Arian speaking there. We'll have more to come on Daybreak Asia. This is Bloomberg.
right, just getting you some breaking news here in Sydney. This, of course, as we uh, head into RBA Decision Week here in Australia, the first meeting of the year, expecting a, a hawkish hold. Uh, ahead of that, we're getting the trade numbers. Imports rising 4.8% month on month. We're seeing a rise of exports of 1.8% month on month and imports of 4.8% rise month on month there as well. Uh, we're also getting the trade surplus numbers of just shy of 11 billion Aussie dollars. The expectations were for about 10 and a half billion Australian dollars there. So uh, when it comes to the the exports month on month of 1.8 percent, there's a slight acceleration from the previous month. Imports uh, bouncing back from that almost 8 percent decline uh, in the imports reading for the month of November, Bell. Yeah, and also just taking note of the PMI readings that we just had out. So these are the private surveys. The first one from Jibun Bank, that's for Japan. And you can see the services, uh, PMI, the composite readings, both of those actually seeing improvement from the month prior and still in expansionary territory. Uh, so a good signal there for Japan's economy. What you're seeing to the flip side of the readings for Hong Kong and Singapore, because both of those deteriorating there, you can see that the reading for the latest period is Hong Kong moving back into contractionary territory, so 49.9. Uh, Singapore as well, slightly slipping. And it is that story, perhaps, of, of the Chinese economy and that weakness. And the response as well that we're seeing, because we've had authorities, again, promising support for the nation's battered stocks after the Friday market route led to an outpouring of frustration on social media. So let's get more on that now with our chief North Asia correspondent, Stephen Engel. And Steve... Yeah, we're, we're getting more promises again. We're getting, again, a lack of details. And I think the, the response to it that I think is pretty telling in futures because you've still got Chinese equities that are setting up for further weakness today. Yeah, and keep in mind that we're heading towards the big week-long holiday in China when people, uh, you know, supposedly go back to their home uh, towns and there's uh, a party celebrations and the like. But the market has been absolutely hammered. Uh, whatever kind of stimulus or talk of stimulus or job boning that was done earlier last week uh, fizzled out by Friday and there was chaotic trading. Uh, the CSI 300 was down 3.4 percent. So we've seen monthly losses now for six months in a row. Six trillion dollars worth of market capitalization wiped out. People are getting quite skittish if they haven't already been uh, you know, over the last six months, obviously. Now the CSRC, the securities regulator, out with a statement yesterday, not surprising given the route on Friday, essentially saying, and I will paraphrase their statement, policymakers vowing Sunday to prevent abnormal fluctuations. But again, it didn't say how it necessarily it would do that other than it would give or provide more medium and long-term funds into the market. And then the third point, crack down on illegal activities. Didn't mention which of those illegal activities they were talking about, except malicious short selling and insider trading. But again, it's short on specifics. And uh, again, how much this will prop up the market, we're not sure. There's been a lot of scuttlebutt and talk over the last month of the need for a, a stock stabilization fund. How big would that be? Where would it come from? Were there offshore SOEs providing uh, you know, liquidity into the market? But right now, uh, you know, many analysts say it needs some sort of jolt shot in the arm right now. Uh, you know, and then in the meantime, the sort of uh, the, the 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 risks keep piling up, right? There's obviously the big issue, the big elephant in the room about the property sector, the structural slowdown, a lot of the political uncertainties. You know, Donald Trump saying that he might he might put in more than sixty percent of Chinese goods to be you know tariffed, that kind of thing. A, a lot of risks. Sure. Absolutely. I mean, the weak Chinese economy uh, and also lack, uh, at least the perceived lack of concrete steps to prop up the property market uh, and also, uh, you know, the political, the geopolitical tensions, U.S.-China. And you mentioned Trump. Trump's now again uh, restating that he would like to impose upwards of 60 percent tariffs on Chinese imports to the United States if he is elected president in November. Uh, Goldman Sachs out with a note uh, late last week essentially saying that uh, clients onshore in China China is saying, and investors are saying, uh, that a re-election of Donald Trump is their top concern. Uh, again, th there's a lot of uncertainty, and a, we, we have to 
question what kind of jawboning from Chinese authorities in the CSRC will actually work. We do have the CASS, CAS, uh, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. It's a think tank uh, tied to the Chinese government. How much the top authorities in Zhongnanai listen to CAS is something to be debated for another time. But essentially a top ap academic there saying there needs to be a immediate as soon as possible, a stock stabilization fund in the tune of 10 trillion yuan, 1.4 trillion U.S. dollars, with about 300 to 500 billion U.S. dollars uh, needed almost immediately. So we'll have to see. Ahead of the Lunar New Year holiday that's coming up, I believe, starting Friday and through the weekend, and, and it's a 40-day period, but people will be traveling probably for about 10 days. See if, the, if we get concrete steps from authorities in China ahead of that holiday. That was our Chief North Asia correspondent Stephen Engel there. And let's get more on that now with our next guest. Zhao Zhe Chia is Chief China Economist at Credit Agricole and joins us here in Hong Kong. I'm, I'm interested so far, just what Steve was saying there about the, the sort of policy response we've seen. Uh, if you were to put it on a, a scale of 0 to 10, 0 being nothing and 10 being the absolute maximum they could provide to the market, where would you say we're at at this point in time? I think certainly they are showing a stronger demand and willingness to stabilize the market and also to stabilize the economy. I think that is a positive signal. But whether this is significant enough to meet market expectations, to meet the needs um, from the market, and also to you know stop this such um, resource sentiment right away, I don't think is uh, sufficient yet. Um, on a scale, I would say like six. I think they could definitely do a little bit more. And I think there will be more policy easing on its way throughout this year as well. So more rate cuts, what sort of number mm. you're expecting here and what else would you be thinking as well? Mm. I think they have been showing like a joint act from multiple fronts, uh, monetary policy easing definitely and the fiscal easing would be also very critical um, because uh, government, more of the government spending are very much needed because of the lack of demand from the private sector. Uh, the specific address to correct the prolonged property slump and also to pop up more confidence into the stock market to, uh, you know, it are all very important uh, tasks for the government to do. So I think it will be a joint act and hopefully they will see more of the policy collaborations around that. We're often trying to, to understand the bottom for, for China's economy <coughs> and bottom for China's market. Do you think we've seen the worst yet? I think that is a um, very interesting question for every one of us who watch Chinese markets. I think given um, you know the concerns from the markets because of the uh, very weak data, because of the, uh, the continued property slump, um, because of the efficient uh, policy easing despite all these uh, positive signals, and also you know the relatively elevated risk premium that people put put on Chinese asset because of the structural headwinds, uh, because of the geopolitical concerns. I think uh, whether we are finding an absolute bottom for the market, I think it is still a debatable question. That said, more of the you know the easy measures, supportive measures are coming out, and hopefully that would help to some extent. But uh, you know, to for a more sustainable turnaround of the markets, really we need to show uh, see more of the concrete evidence of a sustainable turnaround in the data and the macro fundamentals itself. Yeah. Xiaojia, how sticky, how entrenched is the deflationary cycle for China at the moment? Mm -hmm. the, the down confidence spiral, the down demand spiral? I think um, currently uh, still we are seeing more of the disinflationary pressure rather than reflationary pressure. If we look at the CPI, PPI and also GDP deflators, they are all negative readings at this moment. Uh, so the PBOC Governor Pan also mentioned there is a substantial gap uh, from the price levels to meet the targeted level. So these are all telltale signs. Um, 
if we look at the latest on the upcoming data, for example, China's CPI and the PPI data for January, they are also likely to show that China still have this disinflationary pressure. Uh, is uh, is uh, I think mainly is because uh, China's demand remain quite sluggish, but on the other hand, China still have um, manufacturing overcapacities uh, in a number of sectors, including the consumer durables as well. And the people's confidence level is quite low. Their expectation is quite weak. That would also keep the expectations of price relatively low. So there is, I guess, uh, one prevailing narrative that they know that this is a struck down, that, that, that mm -hmm. a slowdown that China needs, right? This is a structural adjustment. If they can prevent, you know, an un unruly uh, situation when it comes to the rest of the property sector, then they can get through this. What happens when you have an additional stressor like Trump, like, uh, you know, a tariff of more than 60% mm. on Chinese goods? I think the talk about further um, trade tariff hike would definitely hit China and also um, more broadly um, for the other Asian exporters and uh, for the uh, you know world economy as well. Um, that, um, but beyond that trade concerns, there are also the other kind of policy uncertainties and uh, also the potential changes to the uh, you know the geopolitical tensions and uh, you know the US China relations I think that put all that together is uh, quite a little bit uncertainties uh, that the market may not uh, like it um, you know or see as favorable for China Xia Jia, great to have you with us. Xia Jia Zhi, who's the chief China economist at Credit Agricole. Uh, let's take a look at how all of this is expected to play into Chinese markets. Mainland and Hong Kong markets open in about an hour, and we're joined by Asia Stocks Managing Editor Lian Ting Tu. And Lian Ting, so uh, we have the pledge from the CSRC to try and stabilize markets. We're talking about this significant, or more significant than previously announced, uh, stabilization fund, but also, you know, a lot more uncertainty with. Uh, investors ever more concerned about US politics too. Yeah, I think uh, the, today the market is going to shape up to be a very volatile session again, even maybe more volatile than what we, than what we saw on Friday. The reason is because there's um, enhanced concerns about the pledged share being forced um, to liquidate, right? That's uh, something we were highlighting on Friday. The m balance of margin financing in the onshore market dropped a lot last week. That is really a showing, a sign that uh, some of the investors, they have pledged shares, they've met with margin calls, and they may not be able to post more margins, and those shares were being forced to liquidate. And then Friday, I think that number was pretty huge as well. So we will have to see how that plays out. And uh, potentially, if shares fall more, we'll see more of those investors facing margin calls, and that's a very much a vicious cycle. And we'll also be looking for signs of uh, 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 national team support. On Friday, we we saw a huge amount of, so, or I should say, reversal of northbound flows going from negative to positive to end the day. So that's potentially a sign that um, some kind of funds are being used in Hong Kong to flow money into the onshore market to prop up the market. Yeah, it's just that story of investors in China that are just looking for alternatives, looking for different options to not stay invested in Chinese equities. So that, that money that's flowing into foreign stock ETFs, how do you think that's playing into the picture as well? Yeah, I mean, that's just painting a very desperate, a desperate picture of onshore investors looking for some return elsewhere just because they can't really get any return at all from onshore market. They can't be shorting onshore market either. So because of capital control, the only way to get their hands on those offshore assets is to buy some ETFs listed onshore but tracking the offshore markets. And that comes with uh, their own sort of risks as well because uh, 
um, because of the very uh, intense demand, the ETF premiums have gone bonkers. Some of those ETF prices have gone 40 percent above the, the true value of the underlying assets. So investors could be facing double whammy risks if the overseas markets face a correction or if the premium suddenly disappears. There is no win there. Our Asia Stocks Managing Editor, Nanting Du, there. Want to come here on Daybreak Asia. This is Bloomberg. Take a look at some of the stocks that we're watching closely at the moment, seeing some significant moves. Some of chemical is one of them. Uh, we are seeing downside of over 10% uh, falling after it projected a wider full year net loss. We are, of course, really in the thick of earnings season across uh, the Japan markets with a number uh, of key earnings expected this week as well, including some big ones like Nintendo. But Sumitomo Chemical dropping the most in a year. We're seeing huge volumes as well, quadrupling uh, average for this time of day. Uh, that is lower than any close since July 31st, 2020 that we saw in one of those declines there. The broader topics is up by just about a, uh, half a percent there amidst what is a broadly a pretty tepid lower day across the region. We're also watching uh, Azora, the Japanese lender, continuing to be in focus on the Friday session that plunged for that second straight day, uh, losing about 33 percent of its value in that two-day stock meltdown. We are now starting to see a little bit of a recovery, 2.3 percent higher for Azora. This, of course, after the bank uh, said that it would have its first loss in 15 years due to these bad loans tied to U.S. property. But just that two-day tumble wiping out 33% of its value, equivalent to about $870 million in market cap. So uh, a little bit of a recovery, better than none, Bill. <laughs> yeah, but as you say, certainly paling in comparison to those moves we had last week. Uh, it is that earnings focus, as you say, and uh, this week we've also got Asia's tech giants like Alibaba who are going to be reporting their numbers following the pretty choppy results that we have from US tech companies. Alibaba, as I said, those numbers will be closely tracked. The company is dealing with internal turmoil and a stock market route as well. So let's get more on that now. Bring in our breaking news editor, Felix Tam. And Felix, yeah, just kick us off with Alibaba. What are we expecting this week? Yeah, so Alibaba, we may see the growth momentum to continue. Um, and we may see the third quarter profit bids because of the strong revenue in the Tmall and also the Taobao businesses. And it is offsetting some of the weaknesses in the overseas sectors. Mm -hmm. And for the policy side, we see China is pushing the household consumption and which can support Alibaba. And for the company itself, it is reshuffling the top management and also organization. So they are going to focus on the e-commerce and cow businesses. Uh, we're also watching SMIC as well. Yeah, so we just mentioned a lot of optimism, but this is not the case for the semiconductor industry. So SMIC may see our operating income slump of about 80% because of the sluggish demand in the smartphone and also the hardware market. And a few days ago, U.S. added more companies to the list of firms that they consider helping the Chinese military. So this is an election year. We may see this kind of back and forth between China and U.S. on the macro side. So for SMIC, we need to pay attention to the capital expenditures as well as the price strategies. There's also the, the tech numbers from other regions. Japan really is a standout. Yeah, exactly. So we can see the earnings estimate of the SoftBank Group. So it's investment fund, uh, vision fund. We may see the listed companies' proportion to have a break-even uh, this quarter. But for Nintendo, we are expecting the weaker yen to support the sales despite the intensifying competition uh, with the PS5. So overall, I would say that uh, for the regional had our look, we may need to wait until later this month or next month for companies like Tencent. Mm. Breaking news editor Felix Tam setting up what is a busy, busy week of earnings ahead here in Asia. And be sure to tune into Bloomberg Radio too. You can get more from the day's big newsmakers and get in-depth analysis from our daybreak team there broadcasting live from our studio in Hong Kong. You can listen in via the app that's Radio Plus or BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg.
take a look at the reaction across U.S. Treasuries. We're seeing Treasury futures really extending those losses investors interpreting. Uh, those CBS 60 Minutes headlines to rule out a Fed interest rate cut before June. We're also seeing dollar yen leading a broader dollar bid in the uh, early part of the Monday session there as well. We did hear from Fed Chair Powell that policymakers are likely to wait beyond March to cut rates, really seeking to explain the rationale in terms of eventual reductions to uh, the more broad public audience for this interview. But that wait and see approach very much being kind of reiterated. And uh, we are seeing bell bond markets a little bit rattled, but still, futures still pricing in five Fed cuts this year. Yeah, the question is when, I guess, if you're saying that Powell's ruling out by <laughs> by the first half of the year. But, the, yeah, the market reaction we're seeing, because you've got Treasury yields, as you said, that are moving higher. Also, in reaction to the to the jobs data from Friday, because that showed U.S. economic resilience. Uh, the, the market reaction, higher yields, also leads to a firmer dollar. And you are seeing here that picture of dollar strength that's higher against the Japanese yen, against the Korean won. Quite a standout there, that move. Uh, Korean won, it is a, a closely traded currency, or restricted trade so you do often see more market reaction in that but the Aussie and the Kiwi likewise those ones are moving to the downside uh, let's just shift though because Heidi I want to I want to talk about something that's a very <laughs> very big story in Hong Kong at the moment I don't know if you've been tracking it but we had so much expectation this weekend because we had uh, we had a, a friendly match that was being played by the Hong Kong side and into Miami so this is the league uh, run by David Beckham and they were in the city uh, for a friendly match and it didn't really go the way that people were hoping for because people had really doled out a lot of cash for this. A lot, a lot, a lot of cash and a lot of hope that they would finally see Messi play. But not the story. He sat on the sidelines for the entire length of the match. So you can uh, just think about the sort of reaction we're hearing, not just from the fans, it's a little bit wider than that. Yeah, very un unfriendly, a very unfriendly reaction and unfriendly, I think the fans would say, uh, situation there with, uh, yeah, as you say, he, you know, we saw boos and jeers on Sunday, the World Cup winner sitting out his team's friendly with a local team. We couldn't even hear the stadium announcers so loud after the final whistle uh, that we, we, we saw those speculators really booing the club's players and they collected their trophy jeering David Beckham when he tried to give a speech, uh, chanting refund refund from the more than 38,000 spectators and I suppose the point is that you know the government also said they were extremely disappointed by the arrangement saying that it might even deduct its sponsorship because of his failure to play the event gets uh, 1.9 million dollars in matching funds and 1 million Hong Kong in venue grants according to the government but also well, I suppose it's interesting because this was kind of the big hope for Hong Kong after it missed out on the likes of Coldplay and Taylor Swift. Yeah, that's right. And Tatler, that's the event organiser, saying that they didn't know anything about it. But the fans want a refund. The government possibly wants a refund. Nobody is happy from what was supposed to be a very positive experience for the city.